Welcome to Newcastle Family History Society podcasts. The Newcastle Family History Society, located on a Wabakal land in Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia, provides support for those interested in family history. In episodes 1 and 2, Jane Ison gave overviews about the records for the girls' schools at Newcastle and Billawila. And in episode 3, she outlined those for the boys' industrial school, the ship Vernon. In the fourth podcast in this series, What Are You Looking At?, Jane will look at letters and information about industrial school children in the Colonial Secretary letters received, 1826 to 1896, held at New South Wales State Archives. These letters complement the admission and discharge registers for both boys and girls. Jane will explain how she was able to use these letters to research the lives of the children and their families. The Colonial Secretary letters received 1826 to 1896 developed out of the Joan Rees Convicts and Others Index. It is a most useful resource whether you have an ancestor in an industrial school or not. The index is now able to be searched online at State Archives on the Museums of History New South Wales website. To find the link, search for Colonial Secretary's Letters Received 1826 to 1896 and select the link to the Museums of History website. The search box, as well as links to explanations about the resource, are accessed from that page. The State Archives webinar explaining how to search the index and to access the letters is highly recommended viewing. It is not my intent to duplicate the information outlined by Emily Hanna from State Archives in her presentation, so please do view and listen to Emily's webinar and benefit from her expertise. Although digitisation of these letters has begun and is ongoing, please remember that almost all the letters remain in Kingswood as original hard copies only. Over the years that Joan Rees, Linda Bowman and Aileen Trinder indexed these important letters, they did not intend to index every name. So many letters with lists containing more than 20 names were often indexed only by subject. The indexes were also very careful to record names and spellings exactly as they were written. Both these decisions mean that searching just by a name and a known spelling, may not identify every reference to a particular person and may also mean that important lists pertaining to children go undiscovered. From 1867, numerous letters in the index are connected to the children of New South Wales arrested under the Act for the Relief of Destitute Children. In researching these children, I have identified both lists of names and letters about individuals in the industrial schools. Almost all of the hundreds of letters referring to these children have been retrieved, copied and read. This podcast will share some of the knowledge that I acquired during that task. There are both letters about individual children and there are often lists of children in one letter. It is important to note that generally, the government expected that the superintendents at the girls' schools at both Newcastle and later at Biloela would inform the colonial secretary when and where a girl was to be discharged. They were often required to seek his approval or justify their decisions regarding any apprenticeship that had been arranged. This communication with the Colonial Secretary was not a requirement for any discharges or apprenticeships for boys admitted to the Vernon. There are fewer individual letters for boys as a result. There are a number of lists pertaining to industrial school admissions and fortunately many have been indexed by name. I uncovered two very interesting lists during my visits to State Archives. In 1867, before any admissions to either Newcastle 
or the Vernon commenced. The government required that the constables of Sydney compile a list of at-risk children. These two lists, one for boys compiled in May 1867 and one for girls compiled in July 1867, were sent to the colonial secretary. The names and family details of the 91 boys recorded in letter number 67 forward slash 585 and the 39 girls appearing on letter number 67 forward slash 4935 appear in the index. It is clear that even at this early stage, at-risk boys are numbered at-risk girls by over two to one. Not all these children were to be admitted to the industrial schools, but many were. Letter number 71 forward slash 3610 lists the names of the girls who transferred from Newcastle to Biloela, and letter number 72 forward slash 4799 gives a complete list of girls sent to Newcastle and Biloela until 1872, permitting the identification of those girls whose records did not survive. And then there is the shocking virginity letter, numbered 67 forward slash 6696, that I referred to in episode 1 of the Bad Girls series of podcasts. At least one list of boys apprenticed from the Vernon and identified on letter 72 forward slash 599 has been digitised. An excellent copy of this letter may be downloaded directly from State Archives. By searching the online index by the number of the letter, the search results will allow you to identify whether you are viewing a name in a list or a letter about an individual. While in some of these letters the child is mentioned as part of a list, in many the child is the subject of the correspondence. For individual letters, sometimes there is a single letter and sometimes there is a bundle of correspondence. Many individual letters remain to identify where admissions to Newcastle and Billawila were apprenticed during the superintendencies of Agnes King, Joseph Hines Clark, Selina Walker and the relieving superintendent John Ledger Dale as they followed government directions carefully. However, very few individual letters remain from the time of George Lucas, who was superintendent between May 1871 and November 1873. Variations in spelling and handwriting used by the different superintendents did occasionally result in a number of different entries for the same girl, and I have endeavoured to identify those variations in the individual biographies on my website. For example, interpreting different handwriting has resulted in Mary Cashin's name often being recorded as Mary Casher. There are a huge number of spellings for girls who had foreign surnames, such as Louisa Otis and Lucy Arkin. Carelessness during the 1870s when lists were created by copying names from the entrance book or from one list to another has meant that Harriet Gardner was recorded as Henrietta Gardner and Margaret Whitty as Margaret White. The letters also reflect how families were often locked in a cycle of institutionalisation. So admissions moved from one institution to another as their family faced the pressures of poverty or criminality. Researchers can search by name, subject or location and collect information about the one family. Often children admitted to industrial schools also appear in the records of the Benevolent Asylum, the Randwick Asylum or the Orphan Schools and this is reflected in the letters as well as in the records of those institutions. By viewing letters relating to inmates' families over a period of years, there is even more variation in the spelling of surnames. There are at least 15 references to the Hanmore family under the names Moore and Hanmore, all permitting the researcher to garner extensive knowledge about the family. 
as Eliza Hanmore was an inmate in the Roman Catholic Orphan School in 1852 prior to her arrest and admission to the Newcastle Industrial School. The letters ordering her discharge from Newcastle because she had been illegally arrested due to her age and the lies she told make astounding reading and give declarations by the constables of Sydney about her family history. Letters were usually written by adults, but at least two very rare letters written by the Newcastle admissions Mary Jane McNeese and Mary Ann O'Hare have found their way into the colonial secretary's letters. It is thought that each letter may have been used by the girl's parents to support her discharge from Newcastle, as neither girl transferred to Biloela. These letters give valuable insight into each girl and her family situation. Combined with other records, these letters helped me identify the correct families of the Newcastle admissions. Both letters provide a little information about the school and give a glimpse into the sad life of institutionalised children. Writing to parents just before the school moved from Newcastle to Biloela must have been encouraged as both letters date from that period. The two girls came from different backgrounds and the difference in their education levels is also apparent when you look at the spelling and handwriting in the original correspondence. Readers of the colonial secretary letters received should also understand that punctuation was not commonly used by anyone at this time. Mary Jane McNeese was illiterate when she was admitted to Newcastle from Berrimer in 1868. She was the daughter of William McNeese and Margaret Logue, who were living on the edges of society outside Goulburn. Mary Jane's life was tragic, and any readers who visit her page on my website are warned that her story contains details that may be distressing. She left no descendants. Mary Jane's letter, numbered 71 forward slash 4353, was written to her mother on the 13th of March, 1871. It shows that she had learned to write at the school. This sad letter also shows us that the school provided coloured ink, pencils or crayons, as it had been written in pink. Most importantly, the letter proved that the two other Newcastle admissions, Eliza and Sarah McNeish, who were admitted with slightly different spellings of surnames to Mary Jane, were her sisters. Her letter is presented verbatim. She wrote, My dear mother, I write you these few lines to you, hoping to find you all in good health. Dear mother, we are all very happy here. The matrons are all very kind to me and indulge me very much. My sisters and I are all quite well. Dear Mother, I wrote to you once before and received no answer from you. Dear Mother, give my kind love to my sister Annie and also to my dear brother and receive the same yourself. Dear Mother, I long to see you once again. I would like you to go to the Colonial Secretary to reply for my release to go home. Dear Mother, the matrons have all left the place. I have not been in any of these outbreaks that have been here. Dear Mother, I have been here for over two years and I think it is very hard of you not to come and see me. I would like you to come down at Easter to see me. Dear Mother, give my kind love to Alice Burgess. Dear Mother, they are going to remove the school to some island and I would like to go home before they remove it. We remain your ever affectionate daughters, Mary Jane, Eliza and Sarah McNeese. Mary Jane died in Camden in 1895. None of her children are known to have survived. Mary Ann O'Hare, on the other hand, was born in Sydney and arrested there in 1869 and sent to Newcastle. She was the daughter of Edward O'Hare and Mary Ryan. Mary Ann's letter was written and posted to her parents 
on the 24th of March, 1871. And it and the envelope have an atypical letter reference of just the date of the 24th of March, 1871. The letter and envelope was used to confirm the family address and therefore identify Mary Ann's correct family. This letter is stored separately from Edward O'Hare's original petition in letter 71 forward slash 2144 to the colonial secretary, hoping to have his daughter return to her family. Mary Ann wrote, My dear parents, I now take the pleasure of writing to you, hoping this will find you and all my dear sisters and brothers in good health, as it leaves me at present. Dear parents, will you be so kind as to send me some clothing down to come home in, and also my passage money? Dear parents, Mr. and Mrs. Clark has gone away from the school, and we have got Mr. Lucas over us now. Dear parents, you must not give yourself any trouble for coming down for me, for I can come home myself. Dear parents, I will be seen safe on board. Dear parents, I was glad to see Mr. Kellard, and also with the things you sent me. Dear parents, give my kind love to my dear sisters, and receive the same yourself. Dear parents, I have not been in any of the riots. Dear parents, I have no more to say at present, but remain your ever affectionate daughter, Mary Ann O'Hare. God bless you all. Mary Ann married and had at least seven children, of whom three survived to adulthood. She died in Charters Towers in 1930. So much can be learned from letters. Those preserved in the Colonial Secretary's correspondence received 1826 to 1896 are no exception. Much may be learned about life, society and family by investigating whether any letter in this resource at State Archives might relate to your family history. In my next podcast, I will look at the lists in the letters that pertain to the reformatories of Newcastle and Biloela between 1869 and 1885. Only the Colonial Secretary correspondence received 1826 to 1896 provides any confirmation of who was there as no records survive before 1886 for any of the three girls' reformatories. The Newcastle Family History Society hopes that this podcast has helped you understand a little of the variety of records available in the Colonial Secretary letters received, especially relating to children and how they have helped build the biographies on Jane's website, nis.wikidot.com. To learn the history of this collection and how to use the index and access the letters, visit the Museums of History website and view their webinars. The next episode in this series will look at the letters associated with the girls' reformatories between 1869 and 1885. Be sure to listen in again to Newcastle Family History Society podcasts.